Okay, hey everyone, we are starting. Thanks for coming back for the one of the very last talks. Um, I'm Siavash, I'm uh, from I'm an assistant professor from University of California, San Diego, not too far away from here. What my lab does for the most part is uh, developing methods for phylogenetics, uh, sort of hardcore phylogenetics, if you want to sort of infer the species tree from for birds or whatever and, you know things that you guys will not find interesting unfortunately so so i had to really dig deep in the things we do in the lab to find something that would be of interest to this crowd and um, at the time we were working on a project with this goal to trying to use phylogenetics to help uh, sort of learning of phenotype from microbiome. And the project was unfinished, so instead of saying phylogenetics help learning uh, phenotypic traits, I just put it as a question mark because I did not know what the answer is gonna be, and we are gonna learn all uh, together. If I have time at the end, I'll also talk a little bit about another s sort of thing, another uh, project we have with a similar theme, this time for, uh, for HIV care instead of microbiome. Okay, so, Everything we have seen in this uh, week has been of this uh, kinds of questions. Can we learn phenotype from genotype? Every single talk had this kind of uh, theme to it. And uh, a lot of the times the question can be sort of uh, formulated as can we predict the phenotype given the genotype? That's how we think about the links. Uh, most of the talks were about genomics. But uh, uh, as, as we heard from Nandita, there, like, you know, microbes are everywhere, so you can start to ask similar questions about microbe, right? So you can think of the link between properties of an environment, which in a hand wavy way I'm gonna call a phenotype, and the microbial composition of the environment, which again, in a very hand wavy way and with a lot of abuse of terminology, I'm gonna call the genotype, right? And so one, now we have this a similar kind of question for microbiome. Are we, are we able to predict the phenotype of uh, a microbiome by looking at this uh, genotype? And, uh, you know, and why do we hope to be able to do that if you want to, you know, if you want uh, to hear, you know, to learn about the association between microbiome and environment, you don't even have to look at scientific literature. You can go to your um, favorite source of news or fake news or whatever it is, and you'll see all sorts of, uh, you know, accounts of how microbiome controls everything you can think about, right? So. If, if we even like half believe all these reports, there should be some hope that we can learn uh, you know, phenotypic uh, or environmental phenotypes from microbiome. And one way to think about this prediction is in the supervised learning sort of framework, right? So you have your, uh, you have your samples, you have uh, the labels of the phenotype, and you want to do, uh, let's say, a classification. And uh, if you just look at the microbiome literature, you'd see many, many papers, and this is a bit like a very small subsample of them, that have looked at various traits, and they have built classifiers based on the microbial composition to, to predict various traits, and for the most part, they, uh, they uh, report success. They are able to do this with some level of accuracy, of course. Okay, so what kind of data are we, are, are, are we talking about there? Uh, you know, this was mentioned a little bit before. You have some environment, let's say your arm you're interested in, you, you, know, you, get, uh, the, you get the DNA out. It's, the DNA is from a mix of various micro, uh, you know, microbes, and um, you can do two things. You can go look for your gene of interest, for example, uh, 16S, which gives you sort of phylogenetic information. Everything I'll talk about today is going to be using 16S data, but the methods are going to be also uh, applicable to uh, metagenomic data, which is kind of similar, except you do a shotgun sequencing of the entire genome. Either way, you get at the end uh, reads from different uh, species or strains of different species, and you don't know what's what, you just have a bag of reads, and, and then you have to work with that. So what do we do? The, Sort of typical pipeline is you take the bag of reads and you denoise them and you sort of bend them into different things called OTUs, which you can think of them roughly as a species. Okay, so so errors hopefully have been removed, and then you have some beans from you know green, red, uh, blue, and 
uh, the other blue uh, uh, set of species. Okay, so, so you have these. And, uh, and what do we do with this? We just represent or sample as a vector. This vector, each, element, each row of it is uh, basically one of these species, OTUs, and, and the value gives you the number of reads from that OTU, right? So now that we have a vector, we are happy, right? Once you have a vector of numbers, you can do all the good stuff that the, we all know about from machine learning, clustering, everything, right? But it's also important to remember that this, this vector is not just a vector. Behind it is biology, and the biology, one way to think about it is the, is the phylogeny, right? So each of these species, you can think of them as leaves on the phylogeny, right? In fact, you know, when people do phylogenetics and microbiome, most of the work that sort of brings these two things together is in this question of phylogenetic placement. Uh, we have worked on it, other people have worked on it, so you can take your, those reads and try to add them to your phylogeny, sort of finding the best placement. Now, I'm not going to talk about that uh, kind of work today, but I just want you to remember the, the phylogenetic meaning of the, the vector that we are working with. Okay, so you don't have one sample, you have a collection of samples, right? So instead of a vector, now you have a matrix. And once you have this, you can, like I said, do all sorts of, sort of uh, standard analysis. You can see, uh, you can do clustering, and in this case, I think it's uh, PCOA analysis, see how samples from different body parts uh, uh, cluster. You could try to see the differences between different groups. So this analysis looked at African Americans and Native Americans and saw differences in the microbiome. Most interesting to this crowd is probably these kind of analysis where you take a bunch of uh, healthy children, some with a disease, and you try to find differences in the signature of the microbiome between the two groups. Okay, so uh, back to the problem that I uh, uh, talked about. What you have as input is this feature matrix, right? Samples versus you know, counts of OTUs. For each of your samples, you also have some label, healthy versus diseased. And you're trying to build a classifier that would uh, predict the, the label for you from your feature matrix. Uh, you know, uh, this is not new. People have been working on this for, for a while, and it seems like random forests have, you know, the, the, based on what I've learned uh, from the literature, random forests are the way to go for building these classifiers. We're not even sort of asking what's the best classifier here. Okay, so just remember all these success stories. Uh, it's, it's not all, uh, if, you know, if you dig a little bit uh, deeper in the literature, you'll find that it's not all uh, so rosy. You know, there are other aspects to this problem. One of the biggest issues is generalization. So this is a very nice study. What they did is they, they took several of these applications of uh, machine learning to um, I think this is uh, healthy versus obese. Uh, so the, the classification is healthy versus obese. And so they, you, you know, each of these studies came up with a model. You take that model and you apply it to data from the other studies. Uh, so what you see, and, and, you know, and what you have here on the y-axis is the AUC, if I remember correctly. So you know, below 50% is worse than random. And yes, if you take each study and apply it to its own data set, even through cross-validation, they usually work well, but the models do not generalize to other, other studies. So this is an issue that's known. People who work on this, they recognize this. So we don't really have you know, microbiome-based diagnostics, right? They're based on classification because of issues like this. So people who have been following the literature might not be surprised by this, uh, you know, challenges of understanding microbiome have been well understood. There are many challenges. Part of it is that we have large number of features. These feature matrices that I'm talking about, they could be thousands, tens of thousands of features, not a lot of samples, hundreds if you're lucky, thousands, but, but no more than that. So far, maybe in future we'll have more. Uh, there are many sources of uh, sort of true biological variation in microbiome, um, in, in, in microbiome composition. Uh, this is the figure that Pierre Borg has put together, sort of showing different dimensions of variability of microbiome. 
uh, uh, you know, there are things like age, uh, uh, th you know, uh, uh, gender, uh, lifestyle, diet, uh, even time, all sorts of things uh, can impact microbiome. Uh, the data that we get itself, so this is real biological variation, but the data also has uh, a lot of noise, it's incomplete, so that doesn't help. And then there is one last thing that, uh, you know, going back to James' talk uh, yesterday, a lot of the data sets that we have and we do training on are unbalanced and biased. Unbalanced, by, by unbalanced I mean the, 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 the labels that you want to learn uh, you don't have the uh, same representation for them. And bias, I mean, you know, things like what uh, James was uh, talking about uh, yesterday. Okay, so there are all these problems. I have this one in red because this is what we are going to focus on. So we took uh, one benchmarking data set. Uh, it's this uh, IBD data set uh, published by Gevers et al. Um, so what, you know, they had about a thousand samples and what they were able to see is that, you know, between people who have this disease, inf inflammatory bowel disease, and don't, there is like a difference in microbi uh, microbial composition. So there should be a signal that we, should, that we can learn using our machine learning methods. Uh, so here we have 600, uh, more than 600 disease, 200 uh, healthy samples, and we want to learn a classifier. Uh, we use one of these sort of uh, 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 standard techniques to, to create these OTUs, to create the features. We got about 10,000 features. Uh, think of them as uh, unique, uh, unique sequences uh, and, and their neighborhoods. Okay, so what we then asked ourselves is, what's the impact of unbalancedness of the labels uh, in terms of machine learning, uh, in terms of uh, classification accuracy. So, um, so what, uh, you know, we took a fixed number of training points, as quite a small number, 243 in this case, but we changed the balance between healthy and uh, and disease uh, training points, right? So it could be, uh, the healthy samples could be as low as 10%, uh, as high as 33%. And, uh, and on the y-axis, I'm just showing you AUC. So the, the accuracy of, the, you know, the area on the, the curve of the ROC, which is your measure of accuracy. And what, what you can see is that if your training set is somewhat balanced, you have pretty good accuracy. As the balance goes down, the error goes up pretty quickly. Not surprisingly, if you make your, your training set bigger, your, your accuracy goes up. This is what we expect, so there is no surprise there. But what we want to work on is this issue of unbalancedness in between the two labels. And, and, and this is not a new issue. This has been known by the you know, machine learning community for a while that you know, unbalancedness is a problem. Uh, this was what my student, Erfan Sayari, was very interested in. I had, I had no, you know, no prior interest in balance, but he was interested in it, so we worked on this. Um, the standard solutions are things like downsampling. So you can take the, the class that's overrepresented, downsample it, so that both classes have the same number of labels, or you can upsample the, the, the underrepresented class. And upsampling, you need, you need an algorithm for it, right? You can just randomly do it. These algorithms are called uh, data augmentation. Uh, there are standard algorithms uh, in machine learning for doing data augmentation. Again, not a new topic. The way it works, the goal is for you to be able to create new samples that resemble the existing samples as much as possible, right? So if everything goes well, the new synthetic data that you create, you want to create new synthetic data. If everything goes well, these would be samples that you could have seen, but you haven't seen. That's the goal. And, and then we'll, you know, uh, it's of course not an easy task to do. Okay, so we took these existing uh, upsampling methods, the, in other words, data augmentation methods and downsampling methods, and test them on the data set I showed you before. If you just downsample your data, you already get an improvement in accuracy in these cases where your labels are unbalanced. 
Uh, interestingly enough, uh, data augmentation does not give you any additional improvement. In fact, it's maybe even a little bit worse than downsampling. And remember, downsampling is reducing the size of the training set. So that wasn't uh, uh, very re reassuring. But we also did one more thing, which was a little bit better. Uh, so what, you know, if you have an upsampling algorithm, there is no reason to stop when the two classes have the same size. You, know, you can keep adding new samples. So we did that until you know, the data set, the training set, became 50 times bigger than what we started with. And, uh, and at this point, you can see you know, it's, this additional augmentation has, uh, has additional benefit in terms, of, uh, in terms of accuracy. Now, why that's the case is I, I, don't, I can't claim I have a good you know, explanation for this. You know, why, why is it that you can increase samples with, with a different algorithm, add them to a training set, and get better, better accuracy? But, but it's, an, it's, it's not a new thing, right? OK, so one thing I want you to notice is that there's still, after, after this, there are differences between uh, the accuracy depending on what level you started with, right? So the issue of unbalance is not fully resolved, but it's, it, it's improved. Now, what we were thinking, being phylogenetic, uh, you know, people who like to think about phylogenetics, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, what do you mean by that? So, if you're looking at healthy controls, like mm. can you just combine them from different studies and get larger controls? Oh, okay. So that's a um, that's a good question. Um, in theory, you should be able to, right? Why not? But uh, there seem to be things like batch effects that uh, that make that difficult. Uh, so when in our hands, when we tried that, we didn't have a lot of uh, success. Uh, with there's there are two kinds of issues. One are like real batch effects. The other is that if you are trying to pull samples, you have to kind of start from a scratch and do all the bio, bioinformatics as well. So do bioinformatics on the pooled sample as well, which is I don't think some it 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 becomes difficult depending on what kind of data you have available. Uh, okay, so, so now we wanted to think about phylogeny. And the way to think about the phylogeny is that it's really just a tree that gives you the relationship between your features in this case, right? Your features are a species. The phylogeny is the evolution relationship between the features. And the hypothesis that we kind of worked on there was that whatever variation you see in, uh, uh, in your features, the variation uh, from one uh, sample to another in, in, in values of these features is a function of the phylogeny. It's governed by the phylogeny. And so if you take the phylogeny into account, you will have better, uh, uh, better chance in, uh, in terms of data augmentation. This hypothesis is not, it's not obvious that it's correct. It's just a hypothesis that we, we are working under. It, for, for all I know, it might actually be incorrect. Uh, OK, so we came up with the algorithm TADA, uh, tree-based associative data augmentation. The way it works is that if there is a phylogenetic ever generative model, you learn the parameters of that model from the samples that you have. Then you use the model to generate new samples. You add those uh, samples to your training set, and you just uh, learn your classifier the way you would always do. OK, so how, do you, how does the uh, generative model work? Before I describe that, I want to just make a distinction between two types of variation that you can see from one sample to another. There is sort of what, what I like to uh, call artificial uh, or artifactual, maybe is a better name, uh, uh, variation, which is basically saying if I take my uh, environment and I sample it at you know, even the same time, 10 different times, I'll get different, I'll, I'll get different feature, uh, you know, uh, feature vectors. It's just part of the you know, sampling noise uh, and, and things like that. And then there's real uh, biological variation, which is what I mentioned before, right? And we want to think about them uh, separately. Well, let's start by an attempt to model uh, the, the sampling variation. Okay, so how do we think about sampling variation? Well, 
we have seen one data point here. It's one across uh, other ones that we could have seen. The other ones that we could have seen just due to sampling variation will be sort of distributed around the one that we have seen. And you can think of this sort of as a binomial uh, kind of uh, uh, or multinomial kind of model. So what we do is we put all these uh, counts of this. So let's say these are all different features, different species. You count how many of them, you, uh, how many of each you have in the sample. You can uh, then just go up the phylogeny for each node, uh, compute the conditional probability that if you have something from this node, does it go left, does it go right? right? Now you have this sort of conditional probabilities everywhere on the tree. And, and you can then uh, just very, so you have a hierarchy of these uh, binomials. You can very simply start from the root and, and you assume some number, let's say 10,000 and draw from these binomials until you get to the leaves. Now you have a new vector of something that kind of looks like the original th uh, data you started with, but it has some variation around it. And you can keep doing this uh, and add all of the new vectors that you see to your, to your sample. Uh, if you do that, uh, we see, uh, we see uh, quite a bit of improvement in terms of accuracy compared to the standard uh, data augmentation methods. So, uh, so this is the new method, ta-da. And, and, what, and what you see also is that the accuracy does not change much uh, at this point uh, based on you know, what level of imbalance you started with. So that, that's also... Uh, reassuring. Um, you can also keep adding new samples after you're done with, uh, with balancing, right? So make the data set 50 times larger and you get additional small improvements. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so this, yeah. So in this case, it's basically there is, for each node, we have a parameter, left versus right, right? So it's P, one minus P, and you just learn all of it from the data. So there is no sort of, we are not putting any prior on, on them, nothing. It's just completely free. Um, okay, so... So this worked somewhat well, and, and, and we got a little bit more ambitious. And we thought, okay, if we, can, if we can model the sampling variation, what we were just doing was just modeling sampling variation. Can we also to, uh, try and capture biological variation? That's, of course, a lot more ambitious. Uh, you know, we are trying to see what are the impact of things like different, different confounding factors, different, uh, 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 you know, different dimensions. And the way we were thinking about this was this, this idea of entrotypes, right? So there is this idea that Pierre Bork and his colleagues have been advocating that, yes, there is variation in microbiome, but you can think of it you know, as you can think about several um, uh, entrotypes, which are basically, typical, for example, there are th three typical microbiomes for, uh, for, for gut. And, all of these variations sort of could be clustered into, into these entrotypes, right? If you believe this, then a natural step to try to uh, model biological variation is to cluster your sample into different clusters, hopefully something that resembles these, these entrotypes, and then do data augmentation separately uh, for each of these clusters, perhaps also trying to balance the, the entrotypes. So that was our, our idea. And the way we went about it is basically you cluster your samples and now instead of just one uh, binomial distribution, you have a beta plus binomial distribution. So how does it work? You know, you take all the samples that you have from one group, one of your entrotypes, you put them uh, on your tree, you go up the tree, you compute these left and right proportions. Right? And now for each node, you have a bunch of left, you know, probabilities. You can model a distribution of probabilities using a beta distribution, of course. You do that, you compute some parameter, you know, the parameters of your beta distribution, and then you can use uh, these parameters plus a follow-up you know, binomial uh, uh, draw to, to generate new data. Okay, so the way it would work is 
you learn your prime, uh, oh, okay. So, you know what, let me go to this one and then come back to the previous slide. So, so you take one, uh, one cluster, um, pair this cluster, you learn the parameters of your beta distribution. I'll, I'll talk about how, how we do this. Then uh, repeatedly you draw from your beta distribution that gives you these left-right probabilities for each node of the phylogeny. Then you draw from binomial, sort of in the hierarchical fashion we described, you get new data, right? And then you can do this again, another draw from beta distribution, you get another sort of data, another data point that's in the same sort of type, hopefully, right? And then you can go to your next group and do the same thing again. Now, how do we learn the parameters of the beta? The obvious way to do it is to just let it be, you know, learn all, you know, the, the parameters from your data, right? So at each node, you have a bunch of, you know, left and right probabilities. You can, you can try to just, uh, you know, use method of moments or something like that to learn the parameters. It requires that you have a large number of samples in each of your clusters. For example, you can't have a singleton um, or, or it doesn't make sense if, if you have a singleton. It also, uh, and also in practice, it didn't work well. So what we did was we tried to use phylogenetic branch lengths to help uh, with setting of these parameters. We did it in a completely heuristic fashion, no, no, uh, no theory here. And or heuristic, I'm not gonna go through its details, but the basic idea is that at any point uh, on the phylogeny, if the distance between your left children and your right children is high, you, need, you want the variance to be low. Again, because our hypothesis is that the more, sort of when you get closer to the leaves of the phylogeny, there is more, uh, more of a chance for things to change, right? So you can change from two very similar things uh, to each other, but not from two very distant things. That's the hypothesis. Again, I'm, uh, whether it's biologically correct or not, um, that's a different issue. Okay, so then I describe how we do this, um, and, and here are the results. So, um, uh, yeah. So, okay. So let me let me describe. So this is uh, the accuracy. If that, so, the, the results. These results on the are on the small on the larger training set, seven hundred samples, thirty three healthy, sixty six uh, IBD. We start with no augmentation. And these uh, five uh, data points here are, di uh, are different cluster sizes, right? So uh, on the left, it's, we have one cluster for healthy, one cluster for disease. And then you have, uh, so put everyone together, then you have four clusters per label, eight clusters, 40 clusters. And this one at the end is the most extreme case where we assign each person to his own cluster which we can do because, uh, because we learn the variance of the beta distribution, not from, uh, not from the data, but from the phylogeny. Otherwise, we couldn't have done this. Um, so, uh, and, and this is just the previous method that we had, which just did sampling variation. And the results are very clear. As you increase the number of clusters, you get better and better accuracy. In fact, the best accuracy that we obtain is if you assign each person to, its, to their own cluster. Uh, for, you know, and, that, and that's the result. And if you keep uh, uh, adding uh, more samples after you are done, uh, so that your data set becomes 50 times bigger, you get an extra improvement in accuracy. Now we are getting to AUCs of 0.9, which is, which is nine, nice for what it's worth. But, uh, but that, you know, this to me was a failure, right? We did not succeed. If, if every individual is their own cluster, it, what it means is that, intro, you know, that idea we had about introtypes was not coming through, right? Now, why is it that we are failing? It's hard to tell. It's something that I want to, in future, sort of uh, um, explore a little bit more. But uh, one of the explanations could be this. Assume that there are so many sort of, uh, you know, the microbiome lives in such a high dimensional space that there's, uh, you know, if you have only 700 samples, it's, uh, you're not really finding many examples of things that are close to each other, 
This could be one reason. So we are really in a, in a regime like this rather than a regime like this. That, that could be one reason. Or it could be that you know, our, our way of doing clustering is not optimal or, or many other uh, uh, explanations. Okay, so, so to just summarize, did phylogenetics help us in learning the microbiome phenotype? My answer at this point is sort of. It helped us uh, doing the, uh, with, the, with the augmentation, but it's not clear that it's giving us a huge improvement. It's also the most interesting part of our method, which was using you know, phylogenetic branchlets, did not give us any extra, uh, extra improvement. So again, work in progress. Uh, the, the, the method was published in ISMB this year, but, but I think there is still a lot more to be done in this, in this area. So I think I do still have 15 minutes, so maybe I'll also, oh, uh, by the way, so this project was in collaboration with Ban Kawas and IBM Research. The project is part of a sort of bigger collaboration between IBM and, and, and UCSD, who is set up by uh, Center for Microbiome uh, Innovation at UCSD, Rob Knight and Austin Swafford help us sort of uh, be part of that uh, collaboration. I wanted to just acknowledge them. Um, I do have like 15 minutes, so maybe I'll, uh, any questions on the microbiome part? Okay, so let me just quickly talk about, can we now do, uh, uh, can we, does, the, does phylogenic help with HIV care? Another, another question in person, uh, you know, personalized medicine where we could hope phylogenics helps us. Okay, so what's the, what's the setting? The setting is the, the following. If you think about how, how HIV uh, you know, transmits through a population, it's a tree, right? Someone uh, transmit HIV to someone else, and through time you get the tree. You can think of this tree as sort of evolving or spreading inside the larger network. That network is uh, the con what we call contact network. It's really mostly like the sexual uh, contacts between different people. Uh, and, and so the, uh, the, the transmission uh, tree is just a subset of that uh, contact network. Now, if you take any of these transmissions, let's say that first one over there, uh, you can think of the evolution of the HIV inside the body of the first person as a phylogenetic tree. Right? So you have a phylogenetic tree inside uh, uh, the body of the first person. The transmission happens at the time of transmission you know, one branch from the first uh, person is going to go to the second person, and now you have another phylogeny evolving in the body of the second person. So at the end, you have one phylogeny that sort of spans different, uh, different people. Uh, you can do sequencing of the HIV of the individuals. In fact, it's routinely done. Every person who is in, uh, diagnosed with HIV gets, uh, gets one region of their HIV virus uh, uh, sequence the pole region. So at the end, uh, you can think of a phylogeny that spans different people. And the question is, what can you learn from this phylogeny? Okay, so just to recap, if you wanted to sort of model what's uh, happening, you could think of a generative process where you start with a contact network. The contact network with some statistical model, with some distribution, gives you Transmission networks, the transmission networks, again, with some statistical model will give you phyl uh, the phylogeny. Phylogeny with some statistical model would, would give you the sequences. In fact, we published a simulator called Fabytes that kind of uh, captures this, uh, this, this pipeline. So you can start from the left end to the right end and with various statistical models create all of these artifacts. The reason we created this uh, generative process was because we wanted to do simulations so that we can start asking the, the, the opposite uh, question, of course. You know, can you infer from sequence data the phylogeny, the transmission network, perhaps some properties of the contact network? The, well, the, the first part of this, uh, uh, this picture is well studied. How do you go from sequences to the phylogeny is, is I wouldn't call it solved, but it's something that many people have uh, thought about a lot. The second part also is something people have thought about. It's a difficult problem. It's more difficult than what you may realize. So think of this phylogeny that I have up here. Depending on how I color, so each color is a different individual, right? 
Depending on how I color internal nodes, and in the phylogeny, you never know the color, the, you don't know the identity of the internal nodes, right? Depending on how I color the internal nodes, you get different transmission trees, right? So if this node was in the body of the green person, and this one also was green, then the green has uh, transmitted to blue and, and, and to the purple, right? And, and this is not even considering deeper coalescences and, and more complex uh, scenarios, right? So going from phylogeny to transmission network is actually a very difficult problem unless you have many, many samples from each person. Then it becomes a little bit uh, easier. But we don't usually have that. Anyway. But what I'm interested in actually is something else. And if I can just tell you what the problem is, uh, uh, maybe that, that would be enough. What I'm interested in is if we get the phylogeny, what actionable predictions can we, uh, can we come up with based on the phylogeny? So what would that look like? Uh, the way, you know, it took me a long time to realize this is the right way to think about it. But at this point, the way I think about it is this. You have a phylogeny where each node is the HIV of one person, can you use that data to prioritize the patients for care? In other words, can you tell me, if I don't do anything, which of these people are more likely to transmit to other people in the future? That's what we want to predict. It's again a very difficult thing to predict, given that you have only the phylogeny, you, have, you don't have, in this setting, you don't have any other information. But, but, but can it be done? So we, we started uh, learning about this, and the, uh, as far as we can tell, the only other method that has been tried is this work that came out in 2018 by some of our collaborators. Uh, so what they do is this. They just take all the sequences, HIV sequences, and they cluster them together based on genetic distance. It's, it's, it's a simple clustering of sequences. Now you do this clustering in different time points, and you just look at which of these clusters are growing in size. And, uh, and so the idea here is that whatever cluster grew in past is going to grow uh, in future as well. And that's, that's, so you basically order patients based on the rate of increase in the size of the cluster they are in. That's, uh, that's the standard method. Uh, what we came up with is, uh, is an extremely simple algorithm. And, you know, I, we started with all sorts of sort of uh, complex machine learning methods. Nothing was working very well. The best thing that we have been able to come up with so far is this super simple algorithm. You t just take your phylogeny and you order the leaves based on the length of the branch length, in t uh, terminal branch length that they have. So in this case, this is the shortest branch length. Uh, you know, that, that person is prioritized first, then second. And this has a long branch, is the, is the lowest priority. All right, so you couldn't come up with a simpler algorithm. But, uh, but why would this ever work? So we have some intuitions for why it works. And the key insight is this. So let's say you have person A, they infect person B and person C. If you think about the coalescence, Right, so now each of these uh, sort of triangles is, is one person. Uh, and think about different time points. So at, at, you know, at the time where, so think about time B, the phylogeny that you would have observed at that point would have been looking like this, right? Now after, uh, after that point, that time, you know, this person, the, the other person is also, uh, uh, add it to your system, and what that can do, uh, and, and okay, and it's transmitted, uh, in other words, uh, this uh, person C is being uh, infected by person A, what that infection will do is shorten the branch length, with, with high probability, it will shorten the branch length uh, above this uh, person A. Now, it's, it's coalescent, so it doesn't have to happen that way. It can be that you know, C will coalesce with B first, but that scenario is less likely than the first uh, scenario. The more likely scenario is that B, uh, say C will coalesce with A first, and, and so make that terminal branch length uh, shorter. Okay, so if someone keeps uh, transmitting to other people, their branch length should keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter, right? So 
the length of the branch lengths has signaled about how many times they have uh, transmitted in the past. In fact, in simulations using that framework that I described, you can see this. So, uh, so this is time, uh, normalized time since infection for each person. And on the y-axis is the average uh, branch length in the true phylogeny, which we know because it's in a simulation. People who never infect others are shown in green. They have on average longer branch length, and the more you transmit, the shorter and the shorter the average branch length uh, gets. So there is signal, but how strong is the signal? So we, uh, so this is uh, this is the answer. Uh, so let me just tell you what this is. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, we have so you, we've prioritized all the people. We take the top two percent, four percent, all the way to top ten percent of the individuals who have been diagnosed, of course. So in these simulations, we have also a notion of who is diagnosed, who is not diagnosed. We take the top 10% of people who are diagnosed, and we ask uh, in the future, uh, in, in, you know, after we do this prioritization, how many people each person is infecting? And uh, so transmissions per person. And we sort of normalize that number so that zero means that they are infecting as many people as sort of the average population and one if it was one it means that like it's, it's the optimal uh, answer okay. and, and what you can see here is that uh, if you just do that cluster growth method that i mentioned you barely do better than random if you use our method you do a little bit better than, than random so it's you know you, you can't mistake this for random we are doing better than random ordering uh, you know, how much better, it's not, it's, it's not a lot better, but it's definitely better than random. You can, you can test this across different, you know, parameters of the simulation. I, I don't want to bore you with, like, the details of what these are. Just think of each of these as the different parameter of the simulation. And the y-axis is sort of the correlation between the order that we get and the optimal ordering. And again, you can always do better than random. You can do better than the state of the art, which is cluster growth. But it's still, you know, the, this, these predictions are not something that I would call actionable. It's not, you know, getting orders that are a little bit better than random, uh, but nowhere near as good as optimal ordering uh, is still, um, there is a still a lot of room for improvement. So again, does, did the phylogeny help here? Answer again is sort of. So I have two. I had two stories. Neither of them were super positive, but that's 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 what we have. <laughs> yeah, I can I can tell you something else. Uh, let, let me also just uh, thank uh, my collaborators on the HIV project, Joel Wartheim and David Smith, and um, and and grants from the CIFAR uh, Institute. I'll stop there.